You're listening to episode number 26 of the Indie Film Tribe podcast with me, your host, Angela Matamocha. Welcome. Hi there, good people. Hi, hi, hi. Angela Matamocha here of Indie Film Tribe. Thank you so much for joining me today. Today, I am super excited uh, for this person that I have on the line. This lady is a true artistic force. She calls herself a multi-artist. She is an actress. She's a dancer, a choreographer, a producer, a voiceover artist, a writer, and director. But that is not all. She also won an NAACP award for best one person show. Ladies and gentlemen, Kina Ferguson. Welcome. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome, Kina. So great to have you. Oh, it's so good to be here and to talk to you. Oh my gosh, let's jump right in because you have so much going on, so I don't want to waste a second of time. First things first, I really, really want to know, what is it that you love about being a multi-artist? I love that. Uh, Thank you. Um, I love that I get to explore all different types of my artistic expression, and I love, I'm such a believer of not being in a box, so I love that this allows me to not be in a box and I did fight that for a very long time but I I just love that I get to tell stories in a variety of different ways now when you first started in your artistic pursuit what was your first love did you have one thing that initially drove you on this path well I started as a dancer my mom's a dancer so I started as a dancer so I was in my first dance class by two you know what I mean? So I was dancing since I can remember. My mom, she said she danced with me until she was like eight months. Aww. So I felt like I danced my whole life. You know what I mean? Um, but then like I started doing plays really early, but not thinking of acting as a career. It, it just was another manifestation of being a dancer, like movement. It yes. just came to be like movement. Yes. So I would say that dancing was first. But then once I became an actor, they really went hand in hand to me like they seem like they're just in tandem for me so then it just became this thing that was I was always like actress dancer like people like but you love dancing more like nope you love acting nope like I love them both the same I was actually going to ask you that because I do feel like a lot of actors that I know that do have a dancing back background are very like purposeful in their bodies. Do you mm-hmm. find that your dancing experience informs your acting and your acting informs your dancing? Absolutely. Um, you know, I was never a dancer who, I mean, I've been, I was a professional dancer since high school, right? But I was never the dancer that had like the leg that goes like all the way up here, right? <laughs> That was never me, right? But I could dance circles around girls that did because I was always taught from my mom and where I grew up is, and the other studios I taught at that it's all about expression. Yes. It's all about what you're presenting on that stage. I can see someone's leg hit a six o'clock, if you will, but if they're dead in the face and there's no passion coming, I don't care. So for me, they ended up going hand in hand because as a dancer, I was always acting emoting the song, the emotion, whatever the choreography was. So acting then just was like, right, well, now I'm just using my body to, you know, block or whatever on stage, but I'm still just telling a story through emotion. That is so interesting, and I think so true, because I think, like, you know, being able to put your leg all the way up like that in the air, you know, whatever that is, speaks to technique, right? Which I guess people can learn technique, right? But that other thing that you're talking about, that passion, that expression, that talent, if you will, that's something else, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, listen, I I was a very technical dancer, but my body just never had my leg do that. It just didn't. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, that's not where my my hip just would not let it go all the way that high. So it was like, I learned, and especially also to being a black woman, like, 
you know, you, you think about ballet, you know, that's why Misty Copeland is such a big thing, right? Yes. So, right? So for me, it was this thing of like, okay, but my technique is really great, even if my leg doesn't do that, or if I don't do 42 turns, you know what I mean? I have great technique and I have emotion and that's something, emotion and passion is something that can't be taught. So it was like when you marry those two, you know, you know what I mean? And I, I never thought about, like, I never really thought about like, oh, I wish my leg could do this. Or I never thought about it because I was always a really powerful dancer. And did you incorporate dance? And I'm sure you, well, who knows, into your one person show? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just because it is taking the two things that I love the most. Right, right. You know what I mean? So it was like storytelling to me is through the body. You know what I mean? Like if I'm in a whole, like I'll be in Whole Foods and I'll hear a song and I'll just start moving because my body automatically starts choreographing, yeah. right? But it's kind of the same if you hear songs and you think about a memory, you could retell that story as an actor. Mm -hmm. So for me, those things, it was like, well, I can't tell the story without adding movement when I do my one-woman show, so it, it uh, automatically just married super easily. That must have been so much fun for you to create. What was the writing process for you? Oh, gosh. You know, um, I have to say that I, my one-woman show, and I always say this, is not something I set out to do huh. because I never was the person who was like, I really want to do a one-person show in life. It was like, no, I'm good. I don't need that. But I was really being led to do this one person show. I was really being, um, you know, if you're spiritual or not, like I just felt like God was like on my shoulder, like you need to do a one woman show. And I was like, no. So it took a whole year for me to get there. But in the midst of that, I would write down little stories that I felt affected my life, hmm. that I felt had shaped me or molded me in some way. So I was just start writing these little stories and, you know, there was no structure to it. When I finally made the decision to do it after being pushed on my shoulder for a year, I was like, well, I don't really know what a one person show looks like. Like the only reference I had was like Whoopi Goldberg and John Leguizamo, right? Her and both brilliant. Brilliant, right? But it just felt like, okay, people get up and they change outfits and they do these characters. So I started out calling my show No Label because I was like, I don't know what this is. So it's just going to be No Label. Like I have no idea if this is even how a one person show happens. So I basically just started continuing to write these little stories of things that felt significant to me. And I had to get over the hump that I didn't have anything super traumatic happen in my life. Like I had a great childhood and I have both of my parents and you know what I mean? Like, and I had to get over that, like, so it doesn't have to be this deep, dark, whatever. So as I started to write these stories, I was like, I want it to feel like life. So I don't mm -hmm. want to tell it chronologically. I don't want to feel like I need to go when I was five, when I was 10. I was like, life doesn't take us on that path. So I basically took all these stories, met with my director, and we would lay them out like puzzle pieces. And she'd go, okay, do this, 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 this. Let's see how that order works. And then we would just swap it around until the puzzle felt like, mm. that feels like a nice flow. And for that, it allowed the show to be authentic. It allowed it to... I don't change clothes at all in the show, which was something I personally wanted to do is to not change clothes. I wanted to use my body for character. Um, and so for me, what happened is, is that the show took its own kind of writing journey as far as mm -hmm. how they strung together. Mm -hmm. There are some stories we left out that just didn't seem as important. Um, but one of the biggest stories that deals with pro-choice, a writer friend of mine said, I was like, I don't know, that is really kind of personal. And she was like, well, you can't call your show unbranded if you're not willing to be unbranded. And I was like, mm -hmm. and it's going in. And so that's kind of like how it happened. So it literally was just kind of writing whatever felt significant. Wow. Now, for those people listening that, you know, may or may not ever consider doing a one woman show, talk to me a little bit about and to the audience about the writing process. Had you written before? Was this your first time writing? Because you said it so, you know, casually, like, yeah, I just started writing stories. For some people, that might be like, you just started. What do you mean you just started writing stories? What do you mean? Right. Right. Well, um, I think that was the beautiful thing is that I didn't give myself any limitations on the story writing. Like I just wrote it as if I was telling a friend about an incident that happened to me when I was five or when I was 10. 
So there were no like, you have to build this story. It was just like, this is the story. This is what happened. He said this, she said this, and then I did this, and I felt like this, and da-da-da, right? So that for me allowed the freedom to come out and the authenticity of the story. And then from there, you kind of can shape with your director. But I really didn't want to limit myself. Now, I had written before. I had done a short film called Kai that did like, I don't know, at this point, we're at like 40 festivals uh, worldwide. We won a few awards, got picked up for television distribution. And that story was my first time ever writing a script. And I will say that in writing that script, like, no, I hadn't taken a writing class. But again, I just was like, I have an idea. The only thing I kind of need to do is kind of vomit it out, if you you will, like, get it all out there. You can always go back and, and, and structure and make sure it fits the flow. But like, got to get it out on paper first for there to even start that process. Yeah. And I think that's what's super important for me is to get it all out. And then I can step back and go, huh. And, then, and, I, and I love to have other people read my stuff because I think you need more than one set of eyes on any project you do. Um, you know, that you, you have to get critiques. You have to. It's just imperative. This is so interesting because we spent our last, um, not the last couple episodes, but earlier in the month, we talked to a couple of screenwriters. We spoke with writing coaches. So it's very interesting to me, and hopefully the audience can see this as maybe a teaching point that, yes, Mm -hmm. you definitely need structure, study with the gurus. Many people do that. But there's people like yourself that didn't do that, that just right. started writing. That's and it. I think that there is so much power in that. Um, and I also feel like that has to do with trusting yourself. Oh, gosh, yeah. I mean, I think you're bringing up such a great point because when I wrote Kai, which was my first film that I'd ever written, I was going to these film festivals. And again, you know, I think a lot of times as an actor, we're like, okay, let me create this so I can star in my own stuff so people will see me as an actor. Right. You don't think about, I like, I didn't think about the writing piece as being like, you're a good writer. So I would go to these festivals and people would say, wow, like, who was the writer? I'm like, oh, I wrote it. They'd be like, oh, I'd love to talk to you about writing. I'm like, oh, I'm not a writer. No, 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 I'm not a writer. And I would shoo that away because I was like, no, 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 I don't write. I, no, it was just about me doing some acting. And so my producers finally were like, you have to stop saying you're not a writer. You wrote this. We won an award for like best short that didn't come because you're not a writer. And it took me a really long time to embrace that because there is a sense of like, oh, well, they went to school for writing or they've studied with these people. So they're writers. I'm not a writer. And there's nobody that says that. There's no rule that says you're not a writer because you didn't go to school or because you don't have correct structure. If you tell a compelling story, you're a writer. And so that was important for me. That story truly, truly resonates with me because I started writing the exact same way. I needed to create a scene so I can put myself on tape. So I just started <laughs> writing stories. And it wasn't right. because I was a writer. It's because me, the actress, needed a character. That was it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think there's power in that, in that not owning that title because you're trying to work on another title, your acting Uh title, but because of that, you end up doing these other things. I think that's awesome. And I also think this speaks to your initial um, idea of movement and dance and that being expressive and kind of storytelling, but physically, right? Right. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I I just think that, you know, my husband always says when you're, if you're a storyteller and you can tell a good story, it really doesn't matter in what form. You know what I mean? Even if you think about people that, like if you think about your closest friend who you're like, oh, she tells the best stories, right? Yes. Yeah. But like she wouldn't be like, I'm a writer. But if you took her words and you transcribed them, you'd be like, you're a writer because you made that funny or you made these characters sound like this. And it was interesting to listen to and I was hanging on your every word. I mean, you know, we get really caught up in what, claiming a title means and I just I really had to start to let that go hence unbranded hence unbranded was born right (laughs) so tell us what is going on with unbranded now so you've done this one woman show you won an NAACP award for it what's happening now so now something else that was such um gosh what a one of the goals was like National Black Theater Festival which is a festival that happens every other year It's where a lot of tours are born, um, which 
I did this festival back in like 2007 and it was one of the best experiences of my life. Like it was just artists from all over the world performing and, you know, workshops and these amazing shows and like all these artists in this one place for an entire week, just performing and just, you know, all these theaters meeting you and people are bringing um, people, theater select people to bring to their theater to perform and residencies and tours. And it was just literally amazing. Um, so we submitted and we got accepted and we got selected to perform. So that is happening the week of July 31st through August 5th. And so because of that, um, you know, I'm in preparation mode for that. And that means I am launching an Indiegogo campaign that literally just launched not even 24 hours ago. And that's to raise money for our crew and all that good stuff to get there. And, you know, we're just, we're artists making sure that we do everything in excellence. Awesome, awesome. If people want to jump on, by the time this um, airs or is released, we will still have a few weeks left for that yeah. campaign. What is the link to that? I'll obviously put it in the show notes, but for those that are just listening. Yes, it is Indiegogo.com slash Kina Unbranded. And so you can find it that way, as well as like all of my Instagram. Kina, if you find Kina Star 13 anywhere, you will find Indiegogo. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. I want to switch gears now. Um, and again, yeah. you know, as I said at the very top of the show, you do so many things. And I feel like we talked already a little bit about of incorporating your dance and your acting and your mm -hmm. writing. Now you're also doing voiceover work. Yes? I know. <laughs> What, I know. Is, what is going on with that? I mean, this is just amazing. You truly express yourself in every way possible. Your voice, I your know. writing, your body, your ah. I know, I know. And, you know, listen, there are definitely moments where you're like, ah, but how amazing, right? Yeah, so voiceover is something that I always, again, I always wanted to break into it, but it kind of felt like, where do you start? How do you get in? And the only thing people kept saying was, yeah, it's a really tight knit. Yeah, it's a really small circle. And you're like, Okay, so, but somebody's in that circle. How do I get in that circle? Um, so I did. I, I finally took a class um, that led me to getting my agent. And literally, it took me two years before I, almost two years before I booked my first voiceover. Wow. And I always, you know, like, I tell that to people because, I mean, voiceover is not like theatrical. Like, on an average, you're getting one, anywhere from one to five a day. You know what I mean? So... You're auditioning a lot, so your ratio of not booking is way higher than like film and TV. So when I say it took almost two years, I was like, oh my God, this is like over a hundred and something. Like, you know what I mean? Like, this is a lot of auditions. Damn. You know what I mean? That like, is that's, a lot. For that's two years. Lot. And to not it's book for two not years. <sighs> um, so, you know, th that's when you're like, gosh, I am not good at this at all. But the great thing is, is that, you know, one of my coaches reminded me, like, your agent is hearing your auditions because you send them to them. So they know what you're doing. So it's only a matter of time, right? right. So anyways, I finally booked, uh, my niche is kind of video games. I started booking video games. I'm in Star Wars um, right now, which is unbelievable. I'm in a couple other games that, you know, I can't say yet, but a couple of other really big games. Um, and then I just did uh, Pandora, World of Avatar at Disney World. And that was, you know, again, you know, you, you book these jobs and they don't tell you what it is. And then, you, sh you know, even when you book it, they're like, yeah, so, you know, you're just going to show up at Disney. And I'm like, so is it, what is it? I mean, it, they're like, yeah, we don't know. And I'm like, you don't know. So then you get there and then the director's like, so this is for Pandora, World of Avatar. You're like, wait, I'm sorry. It's for what? Yeah, yeah, James Cameron's Avatar, he has a world and your voice is going to be forever embedded at Disney World. I'm like, oh wait. my gosh, amazing. Right? Amazing. So, you know, it's it still is the beginning of my voiceover career because, you know, I just started booking about eight months ago. And so it's been pretty consistent. But, you know, trust me, I have so much more to learn and I'm just really... Um, Finding what my voice is. It's just like acting, like finding what my niche is, finding what my voice is, what my voice does, stretching it, but like really being okay with, I have a deep voice. So being okay with that. 
Let me ask you this, because this must be an interesting thing. It didn't even occur to me until just talking to you right now. But when you go out for um, auditions as an actor, um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you get this in the breakdown, but they usually would be looking for an African-American woman, right? Mm -hmm. So when you translate that to the voiceover world, what right. does that look like? Right, right. And it is very interesting because my voice feels like African-American to me. However, one thing that I've noticed is that because my voice is of a deeper register and because I, I hate using a word like I'm about to use, but because of the, because being articulate and very, and I, I get can you very much yeah. be very precise with my words. I can yeah. also translate that to non-African American. So, right. Yeah. So that's why I think that's also why a lot of the video games I'm booking they have a lot of a very real quality to them. Mm. Some of them haven't even been ethnic specific. It's just been about like a confidence in a voice, a gravitas of a voice, um, a gravitas, sorry, of a voice. You know what I mean? And it's interesting because for Star Wars, when the forums were coming out, which I had no idea there were all these forums for video games. I was not a gamer up until I'm just becoming a gamer. People were like, I don't know, is, does, she, does that sound like a black girl's voice? I don't know. I just think she's, maybe she's black. I don't know. I think she's African American. You know what I mean? Like the fact that they were having a conversation trying to be like, is that a black girl? Well, maybe she's, you know what I mean? It was very interesting to me that that was even in conversation. You know what I mean? But at the same time, some people were really happy. Like, oh, I'm glad that they're diversifying. Other people were like, I don't know. Until they looked me up on IMDb. Then they're like, someone was like, she's black. Yeah, she's black. <laughs> You're like, yep, that'd be I. It must yeah, be. Is it kind of a relief? I don't know if relief is the right word, but a freedom. Maybe it's a bit freeing to know that when you're auditioning for these voiceover jobs, it's not race specific as much as it is in acting. Is that an all like a freedom for you, a thought for you, or just? I, I haven't found the freedom in it yet. I huh. do still. Especially because, you know, with voiceover, there's a, there's there's different categories. There's, you know, video games, there's commercials, there's yep. promos, animation. Um, for me, what I found is, like, I haven't booked commercially as a voiceover actor, and I find that those tend to be more middle America sounding. Ah, uh, so interesting. So that's something for me where I'm like, oh, I haven't found the freedom to just be super confident in my voice commercially because in my head the image of what they want it to sound like may not be me. Right, right. Oh, that's interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, even though they won't have a race, if it just says, mom, um, upbeat, you know, middle America, whatever, in my head that doesn't feel like a black woman. Right. So, but I will say, I have a friend who works a lot doing that and it is about, it's kind of the words you're using, freedom. Like when you release that, if you're just being true to being that mom, then that mom can translate across, you know, everything. Hmm. That's so, interesting. Yeah. So I'm still working on giving myself, excuse me, that freedom whenever it's certain things like that, commercials and, you know, or even certain animations where it's not race specific, but feeling like I may sound ethnic and even though it's not race specific, thinking they want something, which kind of goes into acting where we always think we want to give them what we think they want instead of just what we are. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. I was going to ask you, what was the most challenging thing about you becoming a voiceover artist? And I feel like you already answered that question in the beginning when you talked about not booking anything for two years. I mean, that really takes some Per perseverance it takes faith it takes trust okay. I mean so oh many people would have just been like bye I'm done oh, I know I know and and you know my agent I just you know when I booked my first job like I brought them all like a whole basket of like gifts for every <laughs> single person in that office because I was like you guys stuck it like you know you guys could have dropped me yep. at any point you know, but they were like, we knew you'd book eventually. We knew you'd book. Like, we knew it was just a matter of time. You have a great voice. It's just a matter of time. And I was like, you guys felt like that? Because every month I was like, they're going to drop me. They're going to drop. Like, every month I was like, they're going to drop me. Totally <sighs> drop me. Um, 
what it is. It is, did take perseverance and I started coaching a lot and my coaches would be like, your voice sounds great. And it's kind of like with an acting, right? It's like with acting, like, no, you had a great audition. They just went another way. Yeah. Well, if it was that great, they would have picked me. You know? <laughs> no, that's not the case. That's not the case, which makes me veer to my next question. And I know because you have a lot of behind the scenes experience as a producer. So you mentioned, and for people that are listening, I first became aware of Kina before I actually like saw her face. I saw your film. And that's how I first saw you. I think a friend of mine was in your film, Kai. I don't know where I was. Somehow I had seen it, and I just absolutely oh. loved it. So did oh. you also produce that? I did. What was that like? That's your first time writing a screenplay. Is it your first time starring in a project as well? Not my first time starring in a film, no. But it was okay. my, but of my own, obviously, writing, producing, starring, I didn't direct it, but um, yeah, it was right. a lot. So there are so many actors right now that are really inspired to create their own content. When you did your first film, what was the most challenging thing for you um, that you were able to overcome that you can see other people might hit those same challenges? Um, it's a really good question. Because it's so overwhelming for people. They think, it produce is. my own, pro like, how do I even, like, what? I think it is not being afraid to ask. Like, it really is like everything that you want and need is available to you if you just think outside the box and ask. You know, I think that that is super important because you don't know what someone can offer or what it is. And I also think it's important to not have your eyes so set on like, no, it has to be like this. Because it may not have to be like that and you can still get exactly what it is that you want. And I think that's also really important. I mean, um, for us, we shot that film in two days. Um, yeah, two days. And for me, the biggest thing I tell anybody is to set a deadline. Like, I just feel that if you do not set a deadline, you leave yourself room to procrastinate and to postpone. And for me, it was... You know, it was like whatever that date was, let's say it was June 28th. I was like, I don't care what happens on June 28th. We're shooting this movie. Whether we have no cast, no location, we're shooting this movie on June 28th. That's done. And for me, that always pushes me, especially artists. I feel like artists, we can be a little, we can procrastinate. We can be a little last minute sometimes. We can be a little, you know, just, we're so art, we, you know, we can be so artsy, Right. And for me, I felt like if I have a deadline, I meet my deadlines. Like I don't miss deadlines. So for me, the moment that I set my deadline, I knew it had to come in. I knew everything had to fall into place. Yep. And so that was super important to me. It was also important to me to not get hung up on budget, not to get hung up on the money part because everything is available. Do you know what I mean? You have people, you know, shooting, um, even before iPhones, you have people shooting things with little cameras and sending it in and getting shows and whatever. You know what I mean? Like, if you have a good story and you believe in the project and you got a deadline, you can make it happen. Like, I just feel like you have to not give yourself an excuse. It's very interesting because when you did this film, Kai, like today I feel like, you know, so many people are creating their own content and want to. You made that film back when not every actor was creating their own content. Like how did you even, do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally, totally. People I mean, were not doing it then. That was quite, well, a, like, I, that was a while ago. Oh, yeah, that was in, that was in 2007. And ten even years to the, ago. yeah, right, e 10 years ago. Ten years. And we call it the film, hello. And we've shot it around this time, 10 years ago, exactly like this time, right? We call it the film that never dies because literally still, I get random emails of people saying, can we screen Kai? Sure. I mean, I, I think we had two this year already of just, I never know where they're coming from. It can be like Alaska. Like, we heard about your film. Can we screen it? Sure. It's the film that doesn't die. But I think that um, you're right. People weren't doing that. And 
what you're talking about is like doing everything. Like there was a little part of me like, well, are people going to think I'm a writer or a producer and not an actor? I don't want the, I don't want them to be confused. I'm an actor. Right. But I think that when I say the power it gave me, when I say power, not in the negative sense, but like the strength yes. of I can do this and I can make a project and I can be someone that when I go to a film festival, I'm not just an actor looking for a job. I'm someone who's creating jobs. I'm someone who's saying I too can hire you so that the exchange between you and other filmmakers becomes even instead of please hire me. You're higher than me. So hire me. It becomes how can this dialogue become an even exchange? What This is what I could do for you? Oh, I could do this for you. And that's always more attractive than, you know, pick me, pick me. Yeah, because then you're seen as a potential collaborator and you're in within the film community. Right. You're not like outside and like, you know, an actor a lot of times is trying to get in. You're already in because you're creating it. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I just think that's such a powerful position to be in uh, because the other thing is if you look at most of the actors that people respect and love most of them also eventually become directors and producers because you do want to you want also the stories that you want to be told to be out there you don't only want to tell other people's stories all the time and especially someone like you that is a multi-artist that needs to always express it makes sense that you would start exactly. writing start producing you can't just all right, nope. give me my lines. Right. You're like, nope. I got my own lines. And now I got my own lines, boo. Right. <laughs> I think it's so true, right? You know, it, you, you've done the same thing. So you you know, I you do. know. I do. I remember even watching your journey, editing your film and all that stuff. Like, as I'm not going to say it's easy. It's a lot of hard work and there's a lot of, like, stumbling blocks of, like, and I was figuring it out as I went, like, uh, what happened? Okay, so this is what we're going to try to do, right? Yep. And you yep. surround yourself with people who believe in your vision and people who are like, I got you. Then, you know, what I mean? at the end of the day, you can't fail. Because even when you want to slip, someone else is going to be there to be like, no, no, come on, we got it. Yep. You know? We talked a little bit about your producing we hit on your dancing a little bit when we talked about your one woman show and your writing and your voiceover directing that yes. is also on this list. What is. is going on with this? Yes. So directing again, feels like choreography. Uh huh. It, um, the, I started assistant directing, I started assisting directing my fr my uh, this guy I call my brother. Him and I were partners, and my distribution deal I had producing feature films was with him. I started assistant directing him in, in theater. And, you know, you have to pay attention. Artists have to pay attention to the things that people point, you at, point at you about. People always would ask me to sit in on theater rehearsals and give notes. Or they would say, hey, this show's going up next week. Could you just watch and let us know if there's anything, right? I never took that as anything except for that I was an actor and they just asked me. Right. Not right. realizing that what they saw in me was that I have an eye for as a director. I just didn't have that title associated with it, right? So fast forward, I'm assistant directing with my business partner and actors are coming to me to work on things. And again, I'm just like, oh, I'm just assistant directing my friend, right? Fast forward, I directed a play called Sunday Morning. That was my first, like, I'm the director. And that play was actually nominated for seven NAACP awards. They took home four. We did a small tour. And what I found that people always said was like, wow, like watching the show felt like music. It just felt like every the way people moved and, you know, like everything just felt musical, right? And it's because for me, I do see blocking and storytelling as choreography. It is. So movement is super important and how things are blocked and how things should feel very natural. It's the same way that when you're auditioning as an actor, things need to sound conversational. Yeah. To me, when I'm watching a theater piece or I'm uh, creating film, it needs to feel like music. It doesn't need to feel stagnant. It should feel like it flows. Right. So for me, that was like, I couldn't believe how much I love directing. I literally was like, I love this. But again, 
But I don't want people to think I'm just a director. I'm an actor. I'm an actor. And I don't know why we're so hung up on this actor thing as if, like, you can't do anything else, right? But um, that, for me, was, like, my first, like, big step into it. And then my short film, Linden Passing, that I did recently, that was nominated by HBO, that was my first film directorial debut. Okay, and, so let's talk about that. So that was your first film directorial debut. Yeah. And you were also in this film. Yes. And who wrote it? I did. <laughs> love it. Love it. <laughs> I mean, again, it's one of those things where people people are pointing at you and you're not recognizing the sign. So with my first film, Kai, I was like, there's no way I'm directing this. I just believe directing and acting in something is is a true talent. Like, I don't take that lightly. And as much as I hate to say this, that there are two sides to that. There are some people who are like, I'm going to direct, act, and start all my stuff. And I do think there's something to be said about, like, making sure that you understand what those mediums are, right? So for me, I was like, I want to respect the process of a director and knowing that I probably can't direct myself um, objectively, right? Not at that point. Not, Not then. A, then, right? Yeah. So I was yeah. like, no, I'm a hired director. For Lyndon Passing, this my latest film, I also didn't want to direct it. I was like, I'm in it. I gave it to other people to direct. And all of them were like, so why aren't you directing this? And I was like, because I'm, I mean, I haven't directed film. And they're like, yeah, but you know, like, as I would talk to them about the story, they're like, everything you're telling me is you being the director. And I'm like, no, no. So literally three people were like, I'm, I refuse. You direct it. I refuse. And so then finally I was like, okay, I guess I'll give this directing thing a try. And I did. And again, I loved it. Now, it definitely was a lot more difficult because you can't see as much as you would like. Yeah. Because you're in it. Yeah. Um, but I did love it. And I was like, gosh, I can't wait to do this again. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, I just can't wait to do it again. And, and what I will also say about directing yourself or directing any project, the thing that people asked me, even when I was at the HBO Awards, people were like, you know, how was it directing? I mean, yourself and all this. And for me, what I tell everybody is I believe in preparation. I believe your pre-prep has, I mean, it has got to be so Trump tight, for lack of better words. <laughs> <laughs> It just has to be because otherwise when you get, cause when you get on set, there's going to be things that are going to happen. There's Always. going to be mishaps. Always. Always. Right. I don't care what you do. There's going to be a mishap. Yep. So if you haven't had a good preparation before, then you're really going to be spiraling. So for me, it's like everybody on my team knew exactly what I wanted. Everybody was clear on the vision. They were clear on every shot. They knew the direction, like they knew everything so that when I got on set, I really didn't have to work as hard because they knew. So I could trust that what I'm seeing, they also are seeing or not seeing. And that for me is, was the biggest part about directing myself is that everybody on the crew was on the same page so that there aren't any mistakes. Kena, I just would love to take a moment and acknowledge you for your, to me, just as I'm listening to you and hearing your stories, acknowledge you for having such a fearless spirit. Thank you. Your spirit is just so like, I don't know how to do it, but I'm going to figure it out. I don't know what that is, but I'm going to figure it out. I don't know, but I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it. I just love that. That is just so awesome and so inspiring and something that I, I'm hoping our listeners are also catching. Yeah. Yes. Because we so, can all do it. Yeah. I mean, just, just thank you for having the spirit and just for being Absolutely. such a such a light and inspiration because thank I think – and as you know, especially in this town, we get so caught up on perfection and wanting to write oh. the perfect screenplay, direct the perfect this, act right. the perfect. We could, if we, yeah, yeah we can really I mean, trip ourselves up. So just to be yeah. able to get out of your way and forge this path for yourself is just so inspiring. So Thank I just you. want to acknowledge you for that because it's Thank just so you. awesome. I appreciate it. But, you know, here's the thing. Is anything perfect? Is it? 
You know what I mean? Like yeah. I can pick out things. I still can pick out things in every single one of those. You know what I mean? I can pick out so many things, right? But the reality is, is like if you wait till you're perfect, it will probably never get out. Yeah. And and then what? Then nobody ever sees it. So it doesn't matter that you're trying to make this most perfect thing because no one's ever going to see it anyway. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's I think that's like awful. You know what I mean? Like there's so many people I know who are talented who I'm like. The world we're waiting, but you won't put it out because you want it to be perfect. And we don't care that it's not perfect. Well, I would love for you to speak on that because I think a lot of artists do struggle with that. What do you have to say about putting a piece of art into the world and it's 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 nowhere near perfect? And then how do you as an artist, I mean, doing all the projects that you have done, how do you then receive that response if it isn't like the perfect project? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I think that you have to... I think it has to be perfect enough for you, like that you can receive the criticism. Because to me, the thing that I always say is it needs to be my mistake. Like, I don't want to put it out. And then someone's like, oh, I really wish you would have done that. You're like, I wasn't going to do that. But this person told me to. It's like if I made that choice, then I'm OK. If someone's like, oh, I wouldn't have done that. I'm like, well, that was my choice. I, that's how I wanted it. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. You know what I mean? So I'm okay putting it out as long as it's my decision, right? Um, because we have to live with that. You know what I mean? And um, so I, I do think, and even this last film, Linda Passing, like I still, even now, hold on to that film a little too tight because it feels mm -hmm. so precious to me. Yeah. And one of my good director friends said, he was like, stop acting like you're not going to make more projects. Right. Like you're going to make more projects. Yeah. And that's for all these artists listening. Like you're going to make other projects. And as much as this feels like this is my one true, pro no, right. this is my baby. Yeah. You know what? In two more years, you're going to have another baby. You're going to have another baby. Another baby, right? So, but if you never release the first baby, we're never going to see any more, right? Because ideas are going to always be coming. Always. You know? So I just think that you have to do the best that you can, you know, and, and and there is a fine line. You know, I, I've also seen people who put out a project and I'm like, but did you watch this and make sure it was right? Like, did you take a look? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. There's also that balance, right? Yes. There's also that balance, which is do everything in excellence. Do everything to the absolute best of your ability. Don't cut your corners and then release it. You know what I mean? Because sure, you know, as long as it's perfect to you, but that also means like, I don't want you to be like, oh, we didn't have sound for this part, so it's just in silence for no reason. Like, mm, well, then you might need to reshoot that part. Yeah. But you know what I mean? So, yeah. I have to ask you this, and this is more for my own wanting to know, just because I went through this myself. Um, what was the process like for you because you directed your last short film and starred in it? What was the process like for you in the editing room? Oh, gosh. Editing right? Uh, <laughs> editing is always... I had to ask. It's always just such a task. It's just always a task. Like, I... Yeah. <laughs> I, it's like... It's like... It's like I always have to tell, you know, I tell my clients, like, don't discount the post-production. Because we always feel like we, I got it in the can. Yeah, that's and just the beginning. That is the be absolutely the beginning, right? For me, the editing, the thing that I learned most, that I've been learning most, is that all editors don't edit everything. And I think that it's really easy to be like, oh, well, this person's an editor. They said they can edit my film. Do they edit comedy? Do they edit drama? Do they do action? Because the reality is, is that I'm also a firm believer in letting people do their job. Yep. So if you hire an editor who just edits, like, oh, well, this person just edits reels, but they've never edited a film, then can I give them this film with the script and trust that they'll put something visually together that also brings in their own creativity as an editor? Yep. Because an editor, I don't want an editor who's just, I tell you what to do, you do it. I want an editor who will say, you know, I know what you want here, but I think 
if you do this and this, it'll really tell that story you're trying to say. Yeah. Oh, I hadn't thought of that because I'm not an editor. Thank you. Do you know what I mean? So I, I know exactly what you mean. And that's what I love about film is the collaborative process. It is. It's such a collaborative process. And for me, that's, that's the thing that I learned is that I really, as much as like it, it is, yeah, it is more work you have to do. I sit through editors' reels and watch them and see how they're, what their reels look like to see how they're cutting and seeing things. Are they visually able to tell that story with their edits? You know, because that's the first step. And then just realizing that that is, that is a tedious process. So I'm like, I'm always like, you got to sit in and put your seatbelt on and just know it's a long ride. It really is. It's not just cut it. Oh, great. It's ready. Like that is, oh, let's go back again. Let's go back again. And this last film was, even even you know more challenging than Kai. Kai, I went through two editors. This film, I had the same editor, but what I, I but it was just more challenging because the way that I was telling the story was my directing style was very detailed, and I realized that it, you know, it, it took it took hours upon hours upon hours upon hours upon, and that could go on forever, right? Right, right. So. Um, and then, you know, and even still, like before, I think even after the HBO nomination, I said to a friend of mine, I was like, yeah, I think I want to find an editor to just kind of still do the little, those little tweaks that I really, really want. And it's like, why, why, why are you trying to do that to yourself? I think that's the curse and the beauty of film as a director. You will always find something to fix. Yes. Always, always. Yes. It's never yeah. going to be like, this is perfect. I'm done. No, there's all, if I could just do this one. Oh, but if I could, always, I you die yourself nuts. <laughs> oh gosh, you can go and edit. Editing, I would probably say was, and we had a lot of challenges on Linden Passing. Not that my, my, my DP said, um, he was like, you literally prepped this film so perfectly. He was like, everything that happened was literally things out of your control, like rain. Like, well, Ugh. can't think about that. You know what I mean? It was yeah. like little things like that where you were like, okay. So even through all that, the editing still to me was the one thing where I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, but again, all you can do is bear down. And sometimes I think it's important to realize sometimes you can step away from something. Like there was like a couple weeks where I was like, all right, let's just back off of this for a minute. Told my editor, you do your own thing. I'm over here. Let's just come back to the table in two weeks on this. <laughs> Because we're both burning each other out and we're not making progress. And it's a thing where you're just so close to the project and you're working on it so intensely, you can't even really see it anymore because you're just no. so in it. So you're taking a step back, I think, is so wise. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Necessary, I think. I think it's necessary because otherwise, I, you, you don't. You, I got to a point with that, um, with my film. I got to a point where I literally didn't even know what I was looking at anymore. I was just like, what is this? Right. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> right. you a times. And you're like, I still don't. But congratulations to you because you finally finished it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Kina, you are just such a light with so much knowledge and so much oh, experience. It's just so wonderful. But before we jam off today, I want to ask you a question just for fun that I love to ask all my guests. Do love you, it. Do you, Kina Ferguson, do you feel that you were put on this planet for a specific reason at this particular time? Or for you, is it just random that you're here? What do you think? Oh, no. A specific purpose. Specific purpose for sure. And I think that purpose, I was going to say it evolves, but I think I evolved to getting to know my purpose more and more. Beautifully said. Beautifully yes. said. Yes. If people want to get a hold of you, find out more about you, where can they visit you? You can visit me on my website, KinaFerguson.com. That's Kina with two E's, KinaFerguson.com. And then I'm KinaStar13 on Instagram. And I'm KinaStar pretty much everywhere else. If you just type in, there's not a lot of Kinas in the world. So you just type in Kina, you will find me. And please find me. 
Oh my gosh. Yes, Indie Film Tribe listeners, please find Kina. Kina, thank you so much for oh, being with me here today. It's been so awesome. Indie yes. Film Tribe, thank you so much for hanging out with Kina and I. Oh, thanks for creating Indie Film Tribe. Of course. Until next time, good people. Bye. Bye.